Thank you, 44Con. This has been a really awesome event so far. I'm really happy to be here. Um, like you said, I'm Jared Atkinson. I'll be talking about old dog, new tricks, forensics with PowerShell. For those that haven't figured that out, the old dog is forensics, and the new tricks are PowerShell. So if you go to the next slide. Oh, shit. Um, whatever. I'm, I need to talk to myself, I, I suppose. So. Uh, Power Forensics is the tool that I'll be talking about. And so uh, without the people that are listed on this slide, um, it wouldn't be possible. So a lot of them have helped me in, in their own small different way. So um, thanks to them, I just wanted to give some recognition. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Jared Atkinson. Um, right now I work for Veris Group, which is a Washington DC um, based consulting company. We do um, a lot of red teaming. A lot of you may know Harmjoy or SixDub. They uh, released uh, PowerShell Empire uh, at uh, at B-Sides Las Vegas recently. Uh, they also do the VEL framework. Uh, they, they work with me kind of on the red teaming pen testing side. I'm the like token incident response forensics guy. And so uh, kind of following in the footsteps of the, the PowerShell based uh, tool sets. I'm also an adjunct lecturer at Utica College, which is a uh, small college in upstate New York. Um, they have an online cybersecurity uh, program. And so I'm an uh, adjunct lecturer in my spare time doing that. I've developed a couple different uh, frameworks, Power Forensics, which is what we're going to be talking about today, um, Uproot IDS, which is a WMI event subscription-based intrusion detection system, and then uh, WMI eventing, which has abstracted the concept of WMI event subscriptions. Um, I also do research on forensic artifact file formats, and so uh, things like Windows Prefetch, um, the scheduled jobs, um, all kinds of different things, and then just NTFS internals, and uh, I made some kind of pretty posters to help people understand that. And then my history is I, I was in the uh, United States Air Force uh, on the US Air Force hunt team uh, from 2011 to 2015. I have uh, a boatload of certs, but that's not really that important to me. So I uh, just noted a couple that are somewhat relevant to this talk. Um, kind of the overview in the, in the Air Force, you always have to tell people what you're going to talk about before you talk about it. And so this is, this is that. It's kind of ingrained in me. Um, or, Kind of the overview that I'm going to talk about is kind of give you an idea of, uh, like I said, I'm the, the hunt guy at Veris Group, so I want to talk about what hunting is and how that kind of ties into the need for the, for the tool that I've written and, uh, and the need for the, the ability to do forensics on live hosts and things of that nature. Um, so we've all seen these different things, right? I threw in British Airways just because we're in England. So um, all these big hacks, OPM is, uh, you know, former government employees, one that kind of hit hard for me, Target, Anthem. Um, JP Morgan Chase, British Airways, all these very large organi organizations are being hacked. Um, and these are the guys that are actually noti noticing that they're being hacked, right? Or being notified that they've been hacked. Um, pretty much every Fortune 100 company, I think it's probably safe to, to say, has been attacked or um, been breached at some point in the past. And so, uh, kind of trying to understand what's going on with that, um, we've, the guys at Lockheed Martin developed what they call the cyber kill chain. And so, um, this thing that you see at the bottom is kind of an adapted version of that. Um, but a kill chain in general is uh, the idea that um, you have some procedure and through the kill chain you're able to identify a place where you can engage an adversary or a bad guy and you can stop and uh, make them have to go, kind of go through the loop again, right? And so in the military we would say find, fix, target, track, engage, assess. So you would, you would find your target, you would fix on it, you would, you would kind of target it, decide what you want to do with it, uh, track it through the network, engage it and then assess how your engagement actually uh, actually worked. And so uh, down here we kind of have adapted it for that find the F2T2EA as we call it for cyber through uh, a Lockheed Martin white paper. And so the idea is, is that you know any cyber attack is going to have some phase, you know, kind of the hacker methodology of recon, uh, delivery, exploitation, C2 installation, privilege escalation, so on and so forth. And so kind of over the t over time We've, uh, the prevailing concept was prevention, right? We wanted to, you know, kind of cut off that kill chain at the earliest possible point, right? And so that was kind of at that exploit piece. And so uh, in the 90s and early 2000s, you know, everybody was trying to stop these server-side exploits. You had, you know, Stored and all these different open source and proprietary products that were trying to stop that. Um, the problem is, is that, uh, as many of you know, phishing is a, probably a pretty, pretty difficult uh, problem to stop. And so the client-side exploits have really kind of taken over from server-side exploits. And so um, detecting and mitigating exploitation is very difficult. And so um, in kind of the, the early 2000s, mid-2010s, we kind of moved on to this incident response model um, to where once you get hacked and you, not you're, you notice that, you're kind of going to kick off that five-alarm fire response to where you're going to figure out what happened, you're going to figure out how you can mitigate that, what, what information was lost, so on and so forth. 
And so uh, the problem with this, obviously, is by the time you notice, it's, it's too late, right? All your informations are gone. So, um, and that was really trying to detect or starting the kill chain at that data exfiltration point in this kill chain. And so obviously that's not ideal. And so uh, the U US DOD kind of came up with this concept of hunting, right? And so it started at the NSA and then it uh, kind of moved into the different services. And so uh, what they're really doing is practicing like the assume breach mentality. And so at Veris Group, we kind of preach the assume breach. And the idea is, is fundamentally, if somebody wants to get in, they're going to get in, right? And so um, no matter what you do, uh, a, a well-funded adversary is going to be able to get into your network. And there's, I mean, when I talk to Fortune 100 CISOs, they say they have more security products than God himself, right? They have, you know, the FireEye, they have um, Snort, they have, you know, every, everything that you could possibly come up with, blue code, all these different things. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, all it takes is for me to send one email um, to, to one unsuspecting user and they're going to click on it, especially, you know, if you make that email make sense, such as like, you send out a W-2 around tax season or something along those lines. Every, every single person is gonna click on that. And so, the idea for hunting is you're going to uh, kind of try to get between the exploitation phase and the data ex exfiltration phase, and you're going to actively pursue and look for um, evidence of infection, right? And you're hopefully going to stop it before uh, your data is taken. And so, that kind of follows this detection, investigation, and response methodology. One of the things that I have seen in my experience is that people are either really good at detection or they're really good at investigation. And there's really no, no group of individuals that are great at detection and investigation, especially when you're talking about investigating things at scale. And so uh, this is kind of my thought on how, how this can happen. So kind of talking about the evolution of forensics, really focusing on that investigation piece. And so uh, I thought this was kind of a cute graphic you have you know, the guy with the stick, and then he sharpens the stick, and eventually he has a MacBook Pro, which is his, you know, hunting <laughs> or investigation platform. And so uh, kind, of, kind of the idea that you have the old school, really old school forensics way is you make an image, um, and then you're going to, you know, get, that, get a hard drive image, and over a process of, you know, two weeks or something, you're going to investigate at a very low level and figure out what happened on that machine. Problem is, is outside of you know, some law enforcement use, that's probably not very scalable, especially when you're talking about large organizations that have 100,000 node networks, right? That's, there's no way that you can possibly do a two-week two investigation on one system. And so uh, some, some folks kind of went into this collection script concept, and then uh, we're talking about live response. So um, anybody that's worked in forensics, you know, this might look familiar, right? That's uh, a write blocker and trying to, so somebody's making an image of this laptop and putting it on that hard drive. And so uh, if you, so we have a lot of like incident response cases where a customer will literally send us the hard drive in the mail in a box. And, uh, and so we, we try to avoid that, right? We wanna be able to look at the system as it's running. We can collect volatile data um, and we can actually do that deep dive forensics on a live running system. And so uh, like I kind of mentioned over the past two, two plus decades, kind of the gold standard has been that image. Um, that's where you take a bit-for-bit -bit copy of a hard drive or a, or a logical volume. And then uh, the good things about it are that it has a very repeatable process, right? And so that's why they kind of talk about uh, law enforcement using imaging because you can then show that your process is then repeatable and you didn't alter evidence and all that kind of stuff. Um, in incident response cases where you're being hacked by Russia and China and those, those types of folks, um, you're probably not going to pursue those people in court. Um, at least that hasn't been what's happened recently. So. And then it allows for thorough analysis. The problem is, is that as soon as you make that hard drive image, you're losing everything that's in RAM, which sometimes can be much more valuable. In fact, almost all the time can be much more valuable. And then it's uh, very slow and non-scalable, as I touched on. You also, uh, the, the idea of collection scripts, this is where somebody would write a batch script or a VB script or even a PowerShell script, and then uh, they will automate you know, the process of collecting a bunch of different uh, artifacts. And so um, it, was, it was really kind of the first step in trying to uh, automate or streamline this process of performing investigations on systems. And so um, some of the pros are speed and scalability. Some of the cons are that often the batch script didn't have the logic in order to uh, access certain files. So things like the SAM registry hive, that's in use by the system, it's a locked file. You can't actually access that file directly. And so you would have to have some sort of third party uh, tool like raw copy in order to copy that file out. And so, uh, and then it does, Typically, these scripts won't have their own delivery mechanism, so they would use something like PSExec um, to push it out, and then it would run and copy back all these files. Well, the problem is, is that um, 
that is not a forensically sound method, right? Because you're pushing out, you're creating a service on the system with PS exec, then you're pushing out raw copy, which is a file which stomps all over the MFT. There's all these different problems that you have. And so, uh, so sometimes it's very messy and those third party dependencies are not ideal. Um, so then we kind of come to this idea of live response, right? And so this is where um, rather than taking that entire you know, volume image or copying back you know, tons of different files for later processing, let's just go ahead and process those files on the system uh, completely in memory. And so uh, we, we've kind of developed that there's uh, certain files, there's a small number of forensic artifacts on a system um, that are actually relevant to your investigation. And so you can actually kind of use a logical flow to flow through which artifacts to look at. And so uh, the idea is that it's very, uh, very fast and very scalable. Um, it's forensically sound, at least in my implementation, I think. Um, and then uh, it's self-contained. So each, uh, each part of the process is actually contained within that one uh, executable or DLL in my case. And then the con is that because you're doing live, live response, it's not repeatable. Um, you don't have an image that you can go back to in the future. Um, and so it may not be the best for law enforcement type use, but it, for incident response, it certainly is. Okay, so um, for those that the uninitiated, I suppose, uh, ObscureSec is you kind of, whenever you present a PowerShell presentation, you have to have a quote from ObscureSec, Chris Campbell is his name. And so blue is the new black kind of uh, saying that PowerShell has taken over cmd.exe in, in complete uh, fashion. And so what is PowerShell? PowerShell is a task-based command line shell and scripting language. So um, basically it's a replacement for cmd.exe. It's much more powerful, no pun intended. Um, and it's built on the .NET framework. So uh, .NET is a, basically a proprietary Microsoft standard that provides uh, access to, uh, abstracted access to a lot of the operating system. Um, and so .NET or PowerShell, although it's not object oriented, .NET is an object-oriented language, and so you can access, or PowerShell accesses objects through .NET, and you can then parse those objects in, uh, specifically like you would in Python or something along those lines. Um, you also have commandlets, which have abstracted all that .NET stuff, so .NET is kind of com complicated, um, but commandlets kind of make them more user-friendly. Um, everything is consistently designed, so if you uh, ever kind of get into PowerShell, you'll notice that all PowerShell commandlets have a noun dash verb or verb dash noun uh, syntax, and so like git tack process or git dash service or you know something something along those lines out dash grid view. Everything is going to follow some consistent design. Um, you have PowerShell object or powerful object manipulation capabilities just because they, it is an object oriented uh, platform. And then you have an extensible interface, which I think is actually the coolest part of PowerShell. So um, Microsoft actually realized that uh, PowerShell is not all-inclusive. All um, and so they allow people to in develop what they call modules, which actually extend the uh, capabilities of PowerShell. And so you can have repeatable tasks and create your own commandlets. And then uh, the thing that has become kind of popular in the offensive circles is the full access to the Windows API. And so you can, uh, through reflection or what they call platform invoke, which is a kind of the more legitimate means of it, you can actually uh, access Windows API calls. So you can do things like um, get process, get proc address, and then load library, and then you know do DLL injection through uh, allocating virtual memory and creating remote threads and all the, all those different things. And so uh, if anybody's familiar with PowerSploit, Matt Graver's uh, tool set, that's kind of what he's doing. And so. Uh, you know, back, back at DEF CON 18, Dave Kennedy and Josh Kelly uh, released a talk called uh, PowerShell OMFG, which is kind of the seminal PowerShell talk for InfoSec. And so, uh, not necessarily because its content was, you know, earth shattering, but the idea that you can use PowerShell in order to, you know, attack, or at least from an InfoSec perspective, um, was something that really inspired people like Matt Graber to write PowerSploit and then uh, kind of popularize PowerShell from the InfoSec perspective. The problem is, is a lot of that uh, emphasis has been on the offensive side, right? And so there's a lot of companies that are actually saying, oh, we shouldn't use PowerShell at all, or we should, we should block PowerShell. Well, first of all, that doesn't fix the problem. Um, and second of all, there are really good things that you could do from the defensive perspective. And so that's, that's what I'm trying to do with Power Forensics. And so uh, earlier I mentioned that there's that detection, investigation, and response kind of cycle. Power Forensics is really trying to uh, kind of answer that investigation uh, piece. So when I first started out trying to uh, di discover what my requirements were, um, I wanted a centralized forensics tool set, so something that was completely uh, you know, self-contained. Self it can do its own thing. 
I wanted it to be forensically sound. If I'm going to call it power forensics, I should probably at least follow like, you know, common forensically sound uh, practices. So things like parse raw disk structures don't rely on the operating system at all. And then uh, don't alter NTFS timestamps. And so uh, I don't, I try to avoid accessing files directly. And I'll kind of explain how that works in a second. And then uh, I wanted to execute on a live running host for that scalability piece. I want it to be operationally fast or um, be able to collect forensic data in seconds or maybe minutes. And then I want it to be modular to where each commandlet performs a discrete task. They could be chained together to the point to where um, if you want to parse the master, master boot record, for example, you can then uh, pipe that into a, part you know, a partition parser and it's going to parse out the partition table and then you can do all kinds of cool stuff from there. Um, and then I want it to be capable of uh, working remotely. And so that, that one is, I'm, I'm at the proof of concept stage and I'll show a video on that, but it's uh, not fully featured in uh, the, the module right now. And so uh, earlier I said forensically sound, I just want to kind of throw this up there. The idea is, is that to make something forensically sound, um, you don't have to be perfect, you just need to uh, change whatever medium you're, you're uh, forensicating on, quote unquote, um, forensicating on at the, the least amount possible, basically. So you want to have the least impact on the system that you possibly can. Um, so this is basically the idea of what the forensics toolbox looks like. So anybody that works in digital forensics, you, have, you either have in-case, right, or, which is you know, fully featured, or you have uh, some really messy c combination of uh, executable scripts and all these different things, right? And so the idea is, this was my flashy animation, um, to centralize all of that in PowerShell. And so the way that I do that, and this is earlier I had mentioned that uh, I make these little forensic posters. This is one of them for the master boot record. The way that I do that is uh, through that access to the Windows API, I access the create file API call. And so that, that allows me to access um, the physical drive, so the actual hard drive itself, um, somewhat abstracted by the operating system. And I can get a handle to that, and then I can then uh, tell, tell my code to access certain parts of the hard drive. And so the very first thing that you access on a hard drive is the master boot record. That, that makes up the first sector in, of the hard drive, so the first 512 bytes. And so this is kind of laying out what those 512 bytes mean, right? And so the first 440, the yellow, the red, yellow, and green parts, those are going to be um, what they call boot code. And so that's actual you know, assembly type code that's telling it what to do. Um, what it's trying to do is it's trying to look at the partition table, which is the bottom you know, five, five or so rows, and it's looking for uh, the first partition that is bootable. And so first, the bootable partition is marked by this uh, 0x80, the 80 hex value. And so once it finds that, then it's going to look at the relative start sector and the total sector. So then it knows uh, that, bootable, that bootable partition, which I didn't highlight it, but it's an NTFS partition in this case, um, is, it starts at hex offset 63, what is that, 636A000, and it goes for 96,000 hex, hex bytes, right? And that's the size of the partition. So then moving forward, the next thing, the very first 512 bytes of the partition itself is actually the volume boot record. And so uh, there's a master boot record for the hard drive and then each partition will have a volume boot record, um, at least every, every Windows partition. Um, and so what, what we find here is that you have the bytes per sector and bytes per cluster. So now you know how big a sector is and how big a cluster is. In this case, 512 byte sectors and uh, eight times 512, which is 40, 4096 byte clusters. And so that's really important because when you're accessing raw bytes on a hard drive, you have to access them in at least sector size uh, bytes or bunches, I guess. And then, uh, then it also tells you where the master file table is. The master file table, I'll show that in a second, but that's um, basically a metadata structure that tells you about every single file that's on the, on the volume. And then it also tells you the clusters per MFT record. And so um, it's kind of a weird artifact. F6 is, uh, is actually representative of negative 10. And so uh, the, way that, the way that the clusters per MFT record bytes work is that if it's a negative value, then it actually represents two to the negative one times uh, whatever the value is. So in this case, it would be two to the 10th, which is uh, 1024. And so, uh, so that each, cl each, cl or each MFT record is going to be 1024 bytes. And then we're able to, from all of that, we started with raw access to the disk. We went to the master boot record, found where the partition was then went to the master file table, and the master file table is gonna contain a ton of information about every single file, and so you have, 
you have things like uh, access modified, changed, and, and uh, created time timestamps, and you have the file's actual name. You have uh, something that points you to where the file's actual contents are. And so you can, you can parse that. If, if you guys are interested in this part, I will be talking in depth about this tomorrow, at, I think around the same time. Um, I'll be really going in, de in depth about how all of this gets parsed and even talk about some of the timestamps and stuff. And so now that you have, now that, you have that, you ha are forensic, have a forensically sound method to access uh, files, right? Because you're not accessing a file directly through the operating system, you're accessing the location of the bytes on the disk for the file. And so you're accessing the representation of the file. And so uh, the next, kind of the next requirement was that it's fast. And so um, in this case, I just kind of wanted to show that I parsed the MFT in 3.9 seconds and there was 200,000 records, which is, I, I th consider pretty fast. And then uh, the US in journal, which is another structure that's pretty important, um, 360,000 uh, records and I parsed it in three and a half seconds. And so to kind of give context, when I first wrote this, it took me 45 minutes to parse the MFT. And so in the process of learning how to be more efficient in my coding, I got it to three seconds. So I think that's a relatively considerable uh, jump. Um, just to kind of touch on some of the capabilities that I have in Power Forensics, I'll go kind of quickly. Um, you could get the master boot record. It has a, a GUID partition table uh, parser. I'll talk about both of those tomorrow if you're interested. Um, I also, if you don't know that it's, if it's a master boot record or a GUID partition table, you can, parse, you can use git boot sector and that will uh, determine what type of boot sector you're using and then parse that out. And then you can also use git partition table which will dump out the partition table respectively. And so that's an example of what git boot sector looks on either a master boot record as the top, the top one or on a uh, GUID partition table uh, boot sector on the bottom. Uh, next, you can look at the volume boot record. And so uh, it's literally as simple as saying get volume boot record. You don't have to know all the, the byte offsets and stuff that I talked about earlier. Um, get file record will dump out the entire MFT. And so this is an example of an MFT record down here. And then get file record index, which will derive the index into the master file table for a specific file. And so that might be useful when you're looking at things like um, system files or files that are not necessarily addressable by, via path. Um, then we have NTFS has a number of different system files, which like I said, I'll talk about more in depth tomorrow, um, but you can get all of these different things. So at the attribute definition, which talks about different uh, MFT attributes, the bad clusters, which is basically a bit array that tells you what, what clusters on the hard drive are bad. Um, Get bitmap, which tells you, uh, allows the file system to, or to keep track of what uh, clusters are in use by the file system. And then uh, get us in journal, which is the kind of the update and change journal. And I'll, I'll really show that in my demo because that's a pretty important forensic artifact. Um, get us in journal information, which is metadata about the us in journal. And then volume information and volume name, which are uh, basically pieces, uh, pieces of metadata about the overarching logical volume. So like the C drive in, in a lot of cases. Um, then there's a few meta commandlets like invoke DD, so it's basically a complete port of the Linux DD command. And so through PowerShell, you can say invoke DD, start for you know, physical drive zero, starting at byte offset zero, going for 512 bytes, and it will output a byte array that represents you know, the five, first 512 bytes in the, in the file system or the hard drive. And then you have get content raw, which uh, allows you to access raw bytes for a file. So you would say, uh, for example, get content raw, um, C Windows System 32, CMD.exe, and we'll output uh, the content or the bytes in ASCII or Unicode representation for CMD.exe without ever accessing the, the true file per se. Um, copy file raw does basically the same thing, except instead of outputting the contents to the screen, it will actually copy the file somewhere else. So um, let's say you want to copy that Sam, Sam Hive, right? You, you try to run uh, copy item, and it will say, hey, you can't do that. This file's in use by the operating system. And you say, okay, well, copy file raw, and it will literally just find where the bytes of the SAM hive are, copy those into a new file. Um, a lot of people have used like invoke ninja copy uh, for offensive stuff to try to like copy the ntds.dit. In theory, you could use this to do the same thing um, without any external dependencies. Then there's things like alternate data streams, so a very fast way to parse uh, alternate data streams. Uh, get child item raw, which will uh, basically lit, do a directory listing without ever touching any of the files. Get prefetch, which parses out prefetch files, and get scheduled job, which parses out scheduled job files. Um, there's also kind of impending uh, Linux support. And so what I realized is that as long as you have access to a hard drive, you can parse 
obviously any uh, file system that you want. And so in this case, I use a tool like fresponse, which allows me to access a remote hard drive on a system, and I run it on a Linux system, access that hard drive on my Windows VM, and I'm able to parse out, for example, in this case, a picture of the super block, which is um, kind of like the volume boot record for ext4, or the extended file system. Uh, I could also, right now I have the ability to look at block group descriptor, uh, descriptors and inodes. So let's actually just go ahead and uh, kind of show some videos for how this works. Uh, let me figure out my mouse here, there we go. So this is kind of a bad quality video. Um, I will narrate it as best as I can. I promise my next videos are way better. So uh, I work with, like I said, Harmjoy Will Schroeder, and he wrote uh, PowerShell Empire, which is a completely, uh, basically a rat that's completely written in PowerShell. He just got a beacon back, um, and now he's interacting with that uh, implant. This is kind of the attack that I'm going to investigate going forward. He's running a couple commands like hostname and who am I, and uh, he's gonna run netstat, I think, here in a second, and just kind of like investigating what's going on on this system. And ultimately, he's after the secret, you know, the secret hamburger recipe for company, you know, McDonald's or something. And so he's looking to see kind of, hey, are, is there anybody else on this machine right now? What are they doing? Um, it's a VM. We're going to pretend like it's a domain-connected computer and there's more going on. But in this case, there's not actually. He's, in, uh, he's going to look in the user's directory. He sees Jared Atkinson. Um, so he's going to do a change into there and kind of list out what's going on in there. He's gonna go check out the desktop. In this case, he's gonna do a directory listing of the desktop and see that there's a secrets directory. And he's gonna list that out. Inside the secrets directory, he sees the finances.csv and hamburger recipe.txt. This company is really secure, so they keep their hamburger recipe in a text file. It's actually the recipe to Krabby Patties on SpongeBob. And then he also sees that in the documents directory, uh, there's a more secrets directory. So he kind of he's interested in that. Um, and then sees password.txt, so he's like, hey, I might as well exfil the passwords.txt file as well. And so now he's making a exfil directory, um, being kind of unabashed in his naming scheme. And he's going to copy all those files into, into exfil. We tried really hard not to have typos in a recorded demo. Um, it, it's really painful. <laughs> we, we probably went through this thing like 20 times trying to not have typos. And so give, bear with me a second while he copies all these files here. And so now he's checking to make sure the, cop the file's copied correctly. And imagine that they're not, you know, one kilobyte in size or 11 kilobytes in size. Imagine that they're much larger. Then he's uploading uh, seven zip. So he's, uh, a lot of APT groups uh, will actually upload like a executable to compress up their files. And so seven zip just happens to be the one that he chose in this case. I don't know why they uh, upload RAR or anything like that when they could just do like make cab. Maybe they want a password protected or something. And then he's going to, let's see, he's gonna run 7-zip and actually archive that up into xfil.zip. And that completed. And then he's going to uh, download those files or download that xfil.zip. And that, that worked, okay. So that was the attack, and so uh, kind of, like I said, I'm focusing on the investigation piece, but presumably you have something that would do some sort of detection, right? And so in this case, uh, we get a notification from like our IDS team or something along those lines that says, hey, on uh, the 20th of August, uh, 2015 at 1650, um, host name, when, whatever that is, or IP address 1023.187, uh, called out to a domain that had never been seen in this network before, right? That, maybe that's the thing that they're, they're keying in on. Um, during this, this connection and then a bunch of following connections, there was a large amount of data, in this case 11, you know, or I think it was like 500 bytes or something, but let's just pretend it's a gig. Um, 
was exfilled. And so now I'm going to basically start my investigation pivoting off of that information, right? And so there's no point to look at the entire hard drive when I can actually, uh, whoops, just look at specific things that are relevant. And so this is the investigation. In this case, like I said, um, at this point when I recorded this, the remoting part wasn't really a, a done deal. And so I just used F-Response, which is a relatively inexpensive capability to get remote access to hard drives via the iSCSI protocol. And so in this case, you, you can see that it presents the ability to uh, mount either physical drives or different volumes. In this case, I'm interested in the C drive in particular, uh, the C volume. And so I'm going to mount that up. So you just yeah, click in F response. And it's going to say, hey, it's mounted as physical drive four. So um, now everything I'm going to do is based on physical drive four. I'm going to import Power, power Forensics. Then just show myself that Power Forensics is in fact uh, loaded up. And then it tells you, hey, all these different commands have been exported. Um, you could kind of mess around with that to see what all those commands are if you're interested. And then, so the first thing that I, I like to do is kind of what I, what I mentioned is uh, what I call temporal pivoting. And so pivoting, creating some sort of uh, bounds based on time. And so uh, we were notified that something called out at uh, 1650. And so I'm going to create a start time that is uh, before 1650, you know, within some period of time. In this case, I think I chose 1648. And so here you see uh, 2015, uh, 8, which is August 20th, 1648 with zero seconds is the start time that I'm going through. And so now I decided to show that. And then I'm going to build basically an end time. And so you're creating a completely bounded uh, investigation window, for lack of a better word. And so uh, I decided to do fifth, 10 minutes just because it's a, it's a demo. Um, and then so what I'm going to do is inside the MFT variable, I'm just going to run get file record, which is going to parse the entire master file table into uh, basically a file record array. In, in the MFT, and I'm going to point it at physical drive four. And so get file record is smart enough to do all of that stuff that I talked about earlier with uh, looking at the volume boot record, figuring out how big clusters are, all that kind of stuff. And it's going to parse it out, and for every single file entry in the MFT, there will be now be a, a file record object in MFT. Here's an example of what uh, the MFT record for the MFT itself looks like. And so that, uh, that's it. It has you know, some modified access change times. There's also a number of different attributes, and I'll touch on those tomorrow more in depth, but you can see uh, it has a standard information attribute, file name attribute, data attribute, and bitmap attribute. And so, oh, good. All righty. And so now I'm going to show how many MFT records there are, and this is actually a relatively small amount. In this case, it looks like 43,000 MFT records. And in real systems, you're looking at like 400,000 probably. Um, this is just a VM that literally was provisioned for this demo. Uh, and then I'm going to create a window. And so uh, PowerShell has a where object commandlet, which allows you to, uh, it's similar to gref, but with like object awareness. And so I can say where object, the born time is greater than the start time that I created. And then the born time is also less than the end time that I created. And so now I only want to see inside of the MFT window uh, array or variable, I want to see only uh, objects that fit that, those parameters, basically. And so now uh, MFT window.length shows you that there's 49 files that were created within that 10 minute window, which really kind of reduces my scope and my, uh, the, the difficulty of my investigation. All right, so kind of clearing it up. And then so what I can do is I can, uh, then basically output, you could either do this into like a CSV if you have more time than in this demo, or you can uh, kind of do, use more and uh, sort based on born time so it'll all be in chronological order. And so when you do that, then it will start going. And so you see at 448, somebody ran hostname.exe. Uh, prefetch files are basically uh, created whenever an application is, uh, is executed for the first time or they're updated every time an application is run. Um, you also see at 448.56, that's the access time that I'm highlighting, but the born time says uh, 448.56, there was an at job created, which is a, just a scheduled task. And so somebody, was, somebody scheduled a task at that time. And 
So I ha happen to have a thing that parses scheduled jobs, and so we might as well go check that out. Um, get scheduled job, raw. There's a get scheduled job in PowerShell version three. It's not very good, so I wrote my own. And, uh, and you just say physical drive four, and you can either give it a path to a scheduled job file, or you can just let it run, and it will go look in the C Windows tasks directory, which is where scheduled jobs are typically stored. And when you run that, there happens to be one scheduled job on the system, and it, it ran launcher.bat. So I don't know what launcher.bat is. My system administrators don't know what launcher.bat is. Um, let's see, and that, it was run at 12.50 p.m., right? And so that kind of lines up with that timeline that our intrusion detection report gave us. And so now we can go see if we could recover launcher.bat. Some cases you can. So um, in this case, launcher.bat deleted itself after execution. Um, and sometimes you're able to actually recover deleted files because the way NTFS works for, uh, for speed and flexibility, it doesn't actually like overwrite bytes or even MFT records. It just marks them as deleted files. Um, and so sometimes you can, you can uh, go back and find deleted files and, and figure out where those bytes are stored on disk. In this case, it didn't work. Um, I've noticed that until you've grown the MFT, um, MFT records get overwritten rather rapidly. And so in this VM, they got overwritten literally in the time frame of like 10 minutes. Um, but what we can do is we could go to the USN journal, which is the uh, update sequence number journal. And so NTFS, if anybody's ever heard, it's a journaling file system. Um, what that means is that it keeps track of file changes, um, creations, deletions, changes, addition of uh, alternate data streams, all that kind of stuff. And so uh, this is what the USN journal kind of looks like. It says, hey, here's file set 3837.temp. It was created at this time. Here's its uh, record number and parent file record number. So you can then reference the MFT to look for these files. Uh, it kind of points back that direction. And you can derive what uh, directory that file was stored in. And so now we're going to kind of uh, look at this. It's 47,000 records again. And we're going to apply those temporal pivoting uh, concepts there to create a USN window. And so it's, it's called timestamp in this case, not born time. You never realize how slowly you type until you uh, have to stand here and watch yourself type in front of a bunch of people. <laughs> and then timestamp, I'm going to do the end time, less than the end time. And hit enter. And now you have a USN window, which USN journal entries happen a lot more commonly. And so there's 1,000 or 1,200 in this case, almost 1,300. And so I can kind of apply the same theory. You can output to a CSV, or you can just look at it on the, in the command line through more. And so that's what, I, that's what I chose to do, just because I knew it was such a small window. In real life, you probably have like an hour or like a multi-hour window. And so a CSV is probably going to be a better bet. Um, but in the case of a 10-minute window where I had a pretty good idea or I'm doing a presentation, it, it works. And so here you see hostname.exe was created. Um, or hostname.exe prefetch file was created at 448, so that kind of corroborates um, the master file table. And then you also see, hey, net.exe was, was uh, truncated, which means that the file was, was shortened um, or changed in some, some manner. So somebody ran some sort of net, and so uh, you saw net1.exe prefetch, that means that they ran net, net use, net time, one of those type of uh, files. These are all just a bunch of random files that are being updated. But, it, but there you see at, job one, at one job was created at 448.56, right? And so um, what somebody probably did was use net time in order to figure out what time it was, and then they scheduled an at job to run you know, a few minutes in, uh, further forward. So, um, and that, like, I, actually it wasn't in the attack video, but that is in fact what happened. And so kind of with forensics, you kind of have to guess every once in a while um, or make the most educated guess you can, but those kind of are